Hello, friends. On this glorious day in drink history, we are talking coffee. Because, ladies and gentlemen, my guest is Brandon Loper, director of the feature-length documentary, A Film About Coffee. I should say that this interview started out as a casual conversation. I was turned on to Mr. Loper's film by a friend and quickly sought to arrange a meeting to learn more about his world. Shortly after our conversation began, though, it became clear to me that this was a conversation that should be shared with others. So that's what we did. And the result is a unique glimpse into the modern world of coffee, as told through Brandon's experience making his documentary, which can be viewed on iTunes. Coffee itself plays an important role in spirits and cocktail culture whether as an ingredient in the cocktails we enjoy or as a constant source of energy to fuel the many professionals that bring this industry to life. Yes, folks, coffee is a big deal. Perhaps we should learn more. Let's do this. This episode of the Educational Drinking Show is appropriately sponsored by Luxardo Espresso Liqueur. If you've ever been to Italy, you know how seriously they take their coffee. So a coffee liqueur is a natural extension in the Luxardo portfolio. They source beans from Brazil, Colombia, and Morocco and roast them locally to make a coffee liqueur that shines in cocktails. Good stuff. And now it is my great pleasure to share with you my interview with Brandon Loper. For animals. I know, right? It keeps growing. The robot is a new addition. As of this episode, the robot has entered the mix. Like um, yeah, so we're talking about your your film about coffee, which is appropriately titled... A Film About Coffee. A Film About Coffee. There's no mistake about what it's about. Yeah. I put it in the title. <laughs> and uh, right off the bat, how do people watch A Film About Coffee? So you can check out A Film About Coffee through a couple different ways. Uh, the main portal is you can go to filmaboutcoffee.com. Uh, you can also find it on iTunes, Amazon, the Google Play Store, um, yeah, and Vimeo is where it's hosted through our website. So yes, and I watched your fine film last night, and it was awesome. Thank it you. was very good. Our good friend uh, Duggan McDonald connected us uh, yes. uh, as as uh, filmmakers, and uh, it was a really really cool film. And our audience is primarily bartenders here. And lots of similarities, lots of, I think, going to be interest from bartenders in your film uh, because coffee has a place behind the bar. Definitely. Definitely. You know, whether it's in cocktails or just serving coffee or some bars serve coffee during the day or specialize in it. And then at night uh, they switch over to more cocktail led programs, but coffee's everywhere. Yeah, totally. And I think the, the interesting connection between bartenders or people that are into spirits and coffee is that you know, coffee's a fruit, it's an ingredient, but the same way you can have a really good um, vermouth, you can have a really bad vermouth, and if you, you have to treat it properly, and mm-hmm. you know, you have to know how to use it and prepare it. And so I think I see sort of it in conjunction with bartenders and people into coffee because they, they appreciate taste and something good, and so they're searching for like that ultimate flavor and that experience. And in the world of bartending, we have bartending competitions. And it's this very high level competition uh, that also exists in the world of coffee. Yeah, exactly. There um, are world barista champions, US barista champions, (laughs) um, regional barista champions. So um, it's a fun, it's a sport, you know, it's a sport. And it was something I I knew nothing about until I started researching this process. But uh, it's part best in show, part Olympics. I'll quote someone from the film. They they mentioned that. Um, they said it's part dog show, part Olympics, and it is part uh, personal crisis. Part personal <laughs> crisis. You remember <laughs> yeah. that's a memorable quote. Good. Yeah. Um, but it's fun to watch, and I think you can be entertained if you don't really understand, if you're just kind of like watching from the outside. But if you really start to know about certain regions where coffees come from or how they're processed, and you see the links these baristas go, um, it's pretty incredible. Were you aware of that prior to making the film that these barista championships existed or the level of execution that happens at them? I was not. 
you know, we're pretty lucky here in the Bay Area to have a really incredible coffee scene. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced to a barista competition through some friends we had at Ritual, the producer of the film, Dahlia Bird. She knew Eileen Hasse from Ritual. And so we went there and that was the first interview we did. And that was really just scratching the surface. And we met a guy, Kevin Bolin, who was competing. He had ranked really high the year before. And I was like, what are these barista competitions? So before I even went to one, we filmed him practicing. Yeah. And there's this guy, like, you know, he's had this the full bar set up in their, like, roastery. And he's, like, going through everything. He has specialty, like, spoons and napkins. And he's, like, got all these cards. I'm like, this is crazy. And then so we followed him down to the competition to check it out. And imagine that times a thousand where everyone's like that. And they have their own posses. And they wear uh, T-shirts with people's names on it. And they make signs. And. Ritual drives like a school bus down to some of these events. So it's crazy. Okay, so you're a filmmaker and you're going to make a film. How did you arrive at the conclusion of coffee as the subject of your film? So as with all filmmakers, we have to make a living uh, doing something. Hopefully you're making a living doing something closely related to your art, but maybe not. Sometimes sort of work frustrations can push you creatively, and I feel like that happened in my life. I was working at an advertising agency, a very great advertising agency, could be Silver Cena Partners here in town. They did Got Milk and different things. And I was working in house um, and, you know, we were shooting a lot of pitch videos and a lot of things in a studio. Um, not really a lot of things where my ideas got to be at the forefront, but I got to be around a lot of very creative people, very, um, very valuable experience for me. But I really wanted to do my own thing, tell my own stories. Uh, and so I left the agency and I made a short film called Unwieldy Beast about a guy named Gary Frank Skaggs. He used to live just a few blocks away. He had a piano bike called St. Frankenstein. I don't know if you've seen him or know Whoa. him. He drove around with a, it's a player piano that he fit to a bicycle, like an old hot dog bike. So it had two wheels in the front, one in the back. <laughs> Anyways, I met this guy, I made a story about him. And it played at a bunch of festivals and people liked it. And for me, it was the first sort of non-commercial thing that I'd put out or non-promotional, just sort of a story to be a story, true documentary. And people liked it. And I was like, this is cool. I like this. You know, as a filmmaker, I was able to get my story out there. People enjoyed it. I want to do this more. And ever since I moved to San Francisco, it's been 10 years almost to the day coming up in October. Um, I fell in love with coffee. I visited, in 2006, I visited the Blue Bottle on Linden Alley, which was a roll-up garage. And I loved the mystique and sort of the, um, the interesting the stuff about it. But what really got me hooked was I tried a coffee from there. It was called Misty Valley, and it's from a region in Ethiopia. And what I didn't know then, what I know now, is that it was a natural processed coffee. Do you know about natural processed coffees? Tell me. So basically, coffee is a cherry. Uh, it's an agricultural product that grows on a tree. It's harvested most, mostly once a year uh, in countries around the equator, warm, warm countries. Um, so it has a, a pulp on the outside, and it has two beans on the inside, like a peanut. It mm -hmm. puts apart. So with the natural processed coffee, they leave the fruit on the outside when they dry it. So they dry it on these raised beds. And so it gets some of that... Um, some more of that acid, that fruity flavor. Uh, natural coffees tend to have like a blueberry note. Um, so that's imparted to the bean. Whereas almost all coffees in the world are washed coffees or fully washed coffees. So they take that pulp off, wash the mucilage off, and then, then they dry it. Mm -hmm. So then they're left with a very clean coffee. Mm -hmm. Like this coffee I'm drinking now from Sight Glasses, a washed coffee. Most coffees, most coffee companies only do fully washed coffees because it's safer mm. it's very there's a high likelihood that a that a natural coffee can get over fermented or become bad so anyway so people don't take the risk especially mm. at a large level but blue bottle they don't really do it anymore they're a bigger company now um this is a long story sorry no, sorry I love listeners it. um they had this natural coffee and i tasted it and it was something like i'd never tasted before you know i grew up I didn't really drink coffee until college, and I started drinking coffee to impress my wife. It's kind of a bad way to do something, but I drank it with creamer and flavored sugar, like hazelnut, all that stuff. And then 
when I started drinking it black, I was like, this is fine. I can do this. I can kind of man up and do this thing. Um, I enjoyed the ritual of it. But when I had this coffee in it's probably 2007, it opened my eyes. It's like, this is something different. There's something different here, and I want to know everything about this. So it sort of set me on this spiral, this tailspin into the <laughs> educational world of coffee. And I had to know, what, what was this? I didn't even, there was no information at that time about what a natural coffee was. Mm-hmm. I had a, a very bad blog that I wrote about coffee and wine called Beans and Grapes. <laughs> and, and, I would, <laughs> and I would write about these coffees and I wrote from a very casual, sort of uneducated place, but I knew what I liked and I was sort of on this pursuit for flavor. Um, I'm from Alabama, so there's not really sort of people, tr- I feel like try to mask flavors in the South. They fry everything or they try to get things to taste a certain way. Whereas in San Francisco, I realized people were like looking for this flavor. And so it set me on this sort of journey. And after I made this short film, I started like thinking, I was like, I need to make a film about coffee. And at the time, the only films about coffee were very sort of social justice oriented. Mm. There was one about how like Starbucks sucks. They're like, you know, raping villages and all these things um, called Black Gold, which it's a good film, but is different than the film I wanted to make. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were a couple little short films. And, you know, at this time, it was sort of the rise of the DSLR film. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people had cameras and they were able to make beautiful images. So people were telling little short videos of their own coffee brand or small little segments. But I was like, I had a vision for a larger story. And I wanted to both educate people and show them how much work went into the process of making coffee mm-hmm. and how beautiful it could be. Yeah. So I decided to set on this path in 2000, I don't know, it's about six years ago now. Wow. Research for about two years. Um, the production company that I'm with, Avocados and Coconuts, they loved the idea and they generously decided to get behind the project and fund our travel and fund the film. So it wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't have been made without them. So I'm very lucky for that. Um, and yeah, we set out on this journey, talking to people, learning along the way. Um, the scope of the film shifted a lot throughout the process. As with any hopefully good documentary, you learn along the way and you change and you sort of find different avenues and it becomes sort of this unexpected, beautiful journey. So yeah, that was very long. Get some water now, sorry. Uh. <laughs> I have so many questions and comments. One, uh, I was really surprised at the low yield of Mm. coffee, at how much coffee it takes to produce a pound of finished coffee. It's like one pound per tree, right? That's right. Yeah, one pound per tree. And that's in most regions once a year. Man. You know, isn't that crazy? It's like you think about how many bags of coffee are on the shelf at Whole Foods. And they're just picking them. They're just picking them. You know? Outside of Brazil which they do a lot of um, machine picking there because they have massive farms. And a lot of it, they're growing like Robusto, which is sort of frowned upon. I think the industry is sort of trying to find ways to make that better because that's a large portion of the coffee industry. But most uh, Arabica and different coffee varietals are picked by hand outside of Brazil. So that's someone reaching up and picking it. And yeah, that turns into one bag of coffee. So. You start going down this rabbit hole, you're making this film, you're doing your research. What either surprised you and or really resonated with you that you discovered as you went down this rabbit hole? I mean, as a filmmaker and as someone who appreciates the aesthetics of things and craft, like I knew there was some beauty in the cafe end of it. I was like, oh, people are treating this differently and they're approaching this at a very high level. There must be I didn't think it was all smoke and mirrors, and but that was something I wanted to discover. I was like, are they just sort of glorifying this really cheap product to sell it for a lot of money? Because, you know, some coffees like are very expensive. You know, mm-hmm. Blue Bottle has one now that I think it's like $19 a cup. It's his Porta Mocha. It's a beautiful story. Um, but so I was like, is this just all marketing? So the thing that I was very sort of surprised about, but also very encouraged was just the other side of the um, the production side of coffee. It was beautiful and mm-hmm. sort of going and spending time in Honduras and Rwanda and seeing where it grows. First of all, coffee comes from the most beautiful places in the world. It's like if you could visit these farms in Honduras and 
Rwanda and, you know, Central America, all these places, it's like coffee is grown in a pretty beautiful place. So it's almost like it has, it comes from a beautiful home, you know, so if people mm -hmm. treat it with the same respect and beauty as its surroundings, then um, it'll turn out to be a pretty nice product. <laughs> I, I love how you capture the locations in the film and you must have just, it's a big responsibility to try and, and capture that in a way you can share with your yeah. audience. And I think you really did it. What was your approach to trying to capture not just the visual of those places, but really the soul and the feeling? Well, you know, I think when I, when I set out to make this film, I had all of these personal experiences that I was trying to relate to my audience. I think that's what we do as filmmakers. We try to sort of embody this lightning in a bottle and then let someone else experience if even if it's a tenth of it mm -hmm. it's like if someone could experience the way i felt when i drank that natural coffee i'll be happy and hopefully i can get it sort of to the next level and sort of add all these other senses this visual sense uh as well as an emotional sort of heartfelt sense um yeah it 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 wasn't just these like wide shots. You certainly had the wide shots, but you had so many great shots of people and just little moments and, and it felt so candid and fly on the wall. I felt like you really captured the essence of it. Yeah, we were lucky enough to be able to shoot some aerials in Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, which that's the only place we shot aerials. It doesn't really feel like that in the film because the way we um, intercut everything, you could almost think that some of the aerials were other places, but that was literally an hour in the air, uh, myself, my assistant camera guy and a helicopter pilot. Yeah. Uh, we were in a little, um, I think it was a Robinson 44. So basically it's a, a real helicopter. I was hanging out of the side window strapped in with just a seatbelt. <laughs> you know, I had the camera on um, this thing called a Tyler mini mount, which is a little gyroscope. I was holding it, it's kind of like a machine gun. And we did <laughs> one loop out from Kigali airport. We went to Lake Kivu, flew around. Uh, and then landed. That was it. Wow. And so that was the aerial that gave us, but it was enough, I think, you know, as a filmmaker, I wanted that, that breadth and that bigness, and it was enough to give it that bigness and vastness of the coffee world. And then all of the time we spent on the ground in Honduras uh, and just sort of the, the small moments that we're able to capture there in Rwanda mm -hmm. really lent itself to showing the scale, the the micro and the macro. Mm -hmm. Something else that coffee has in common with spirits is they're produced by somebody. And that place of origin, that provenance is so important to the experience, to the final product. Can you mm -hmm. talk about your relationship that you developed with the, the production side of it and how that resonated with you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the production side of coffee, you can't deny. And I think it's it's starting to get a lot more press now, and people are using coffee farmers as the face of their brand. Um, I don't think it's exploiting them, but I think it's sort of giving them the recognition it deserves. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of coffee companies now will have like a little drawing of the farmer on the bag. I Some mean, of those guys had swagger too. Like they knew they, they were did. making good coffee. They knew they were making good coffee, and it's their life's work, you know. So I think. You know, we think about the things that we do and we take pride in. And if someone comes to us and said, hey, tell me about this or show me this. You know, it's like if you if you build an entertainment center at your house, it may not be the greatest one. Maybe mm -hmm. it is. But if you built it and you put all that time into it, you cut the wood, you stained it, you know, and you get to enjoy it. It's like you're going to show some around and like, look at this dovetail or look yeah. at these things. And so so you really saw that craft and in the in the coffee with these producers and for me the thing that i always tell people is that whether you like break down the film structurally or or not if you are critical about it like i hope that you take away the next day or the next time you have an opportunity to drink coffee mm -hmm. if you think about david mancia or sebastian benitez or um david in rwanda or all these people mm -hmm. um then that that it's a success you know like when I think about this cup of coffee or in the morning, you know, coffee has the ability, it's powerful. It can take you to a place and transport you. So if it can transport you to an image of someone else and that you being able to be connected with them through this cup of coffee, that's a really powerful thing. And you can mm -hmm. do that multiple times a day. You can think about someone else other than yourself. And that's pretty special. 
There's a really powerful scene in the film where there's, you guys brought a barista, I guess, mm. to a farm to actually give the farmers a chance to taste their coffee in a in a professionally pulled shot of espresso. Yeah. For the very, how, how did that scene come together? So that scene developed, um, first off, we didn't bring them. We, f we tagged along. Mm -hmm. I found out about that story through Kevin Bolin, who now owns St. Frank Coffee and St. Clair Coffee. Um, he was working with Ritual Coffee at the time, and he was um, heading to compete at the barista competition. So the plan was he was going to go make espresso for farmers, a lot of them for the first time, Man. and produce it <laughs> produce it for them in a way that it's people enjoyed in cafes. And he was going to take Sebastian Benitez's coffee and pull it for him there. Sebastian's one of the guys in the film. Uh, he's the one that they ask, do you like it? You know, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I like it. Um, <laughs> he has a, a very cute smile on his face. And he was going to come back and tell that story in his barista competition. Um, so we were sitting in a cafe, and he told me that. And I was like, we have to film that. Can I please tag along? And so it so worked out that a Ritual was gracious enough to let us tag along with them. So um, like myself and... Um, assistant camera guy and a sound guy we like bunked up with those guys <laughs> we were traveling with them a couple other coffee buyers uh and the um the importer allowed us to kind of come along and ride in their trucks and they let us sort of inconvenience them for a little bit but for them i was like this is going to be an amazing experience we have to capture this and um yeah we did they they gave us sort of 30 minutes at the mill to film this scene while he was making the espresso for these guys. And they had brought that espresso machine in from, they didn't fly it in from the US, but they got it from somewhere else. It wasn't just there. So yeah. there was a lot of preparation that went into that. And that was really special. That was one of my favorite scenes. Man, and I mean, you captured it in the film, but outside of what we saw in the film, like what was that experience really like for those farmers? I mean, it was emotional. I think all the people in the room were either, um, coffee buyers or baristas and you know that's what these people are passionate about that's like their life's goal to sort of have this connection and one thing that I really wanted to do was this this concept of like closing the circle sort of bringing um, the coffee producer to the consumer and the barista is the way you can do that mm -hmm. so being able to capture that process it was really emotional it's like you know all of these um, these coffee producers, they they don't know what it's like, or some of them do, but they, they don't like sit in the cool cafe and see people mm. drinking their coffee all the time. They may see pictures, but um, they don't get those sort of emotional aspects. So this is sort of a small window of what that was like for them. And so it was, it was awesome, it was really cool. And how did you end up in Japan? Because as we were saying, we just did this Japanese bartending documentary. Yeah. And the similarities between a Japanese barista and a Japanese bartender are uncanny. Just the yeah. movement, the philosophy, the approach. Tell me about your experience with that. So I became obsessed with Japan several years ago. I was there working on a commercial for Adobe uh, in Miyakojima. And myself and the producer, Dalio, we spent some time in Tokyo. Uh, and I knew about this place called Bear Pond Espresso from James Freeman, actually a a barista that I knew that worked at Blue Bottle, he gave me James's list of people to go check out. <laughs> I was like, okay, I trust this guy's taste. I know he's all about Japan, so I'll go check it out. So this guy, Katsu Tanaka, we've become good friends now. Uh, he sent my baby a Bear Pond Espresso onesie when you know she was small. And, you know, we're, we're close now, we're friends. Um, but at the time, he's a very intimidating guy. So you walk into a shop, it says no photographs, uh, you know, there's a language barrier. I didn't know that he spoke any English. And so you walk in and we're like, I was trying to sneak some photos because it's so <laughs> cool. It's like you walk in, it's like the coolest thing in the world. First off, even finding it is sort of, you know, it's a treasure to find it because it's in this small neighborhood in Shimokita. And um, he's got motorcycles and he sells like, weird American treats and his thing and like books and you know, he had like an Obama bobblehead and just just weird little like coin purses and you know, just very Japanese. Yeah. Um, so 
the first time we met him, it was very casual, uh, but I bought his book um, and we started a conversation. I sort of mentioned to him that I was working, because I was at working on a coffee documentary and I'd be interested in talking to him. And he was like, okay. And so I bought his book and he signed it, Dream Big Katsu. And I was like, all right, cool. Like, <laughs> I like this guy, you know, he's like, thinks big. He thinks in sort of poems and aesthetics. And so it happened to be that that commercial that I shot, uh, the first time we were there, there was a big typhoon. And so we didn't get to finish filming it. So we went back the next year, oddly at the same time. Um, that's advertising for you. <laughs> Decided to go back at the same time, <laughs> even though it was typhoon season. Um, but we went back to see him and this time we had emailed some and we had sort of developed a repertoire because I told him who I was talking to. He sort of gained some trust. So I went this time. We're like, hey, remember me from last time? We talked a little bit. He's like, all right, cool. So a couple of months passed um, and I emailed him. I was like, hey, I've started to making, making some progress. And I emailed him. I was like, would you be interested in us filming? I'm, I'm coming this certain month. And he was like, I want to see who else you're filming. He's like, there are a lot of fashion cafes in Tokyo. I don't want to be represented by them. Mm. Uh, and he was like, maybe you should make the movie just about me. And I was like, well, <laughs> I kind of want to make it a big movie. I was like, it'd be an amazing movie if it was just about you. Um, I still maybe make that movie one day because it'd be kind of incredible. Um, I was like, but here's who I'm talking to. I'm talking to Blue Bottle. I'm talking to Ritual. Going to some other places. He's like, okay, sounds good. So we're able to film with them. And then um, all of the other places that we filmed in Japan, um, one of the relationships from Omotesando Coffee, uh, which is actually no longer there, sadly. So if you watch the film Daibo Cafe, which is the, the coffee master at the end mm -hmm. of the movie, and Omotesando Cafe, which is the square box, those no longer exist anymore. They both closed down. Um, so was Daibo still in existence when you filmed there? Yeah, was Daibo, Daibo was still in existence. And I didn't know that it was going to close until we were in post-production. Oh. But that experience for me was one of the, the most magical experiences, sort of meeting him. It was a very sort of strange experience filming. Um, we were going to try to film at Chateau Hato, which is a very famous kitsaten in, in Japan. We met with them. Um, they wanted quite a lot of money to film there. We we're like, hey, we don't have money. Um, because they film a lot of like cell phone commercials there, like weird stuff in Japan. Um, so the Daibo thing worked out very well. Um, thankfully, our translator and fixer on the ground called them. He allowed us to film for basically 30 minutes before they opened. It was just myself, one camera. He made coffee for us twice. So I filmed that. I just like followed him around. We had a sound recorder. Um, yeah, it was very sort of um, run and gun. Wow. You know, it was after a long night in Tokyo of karaoke. And so it was, it was kind of a haze, but um, it was awesome. And since then, um, the film has launched in Japan. So right now it's running in different theaters in Japan. Oh, wow. Which is kind of amazing. I get people text me like movie posters of my movie just up and sort of um, what's the the busy crosswalk um, Shinjuku mm -hmm. like that crosswalk right there like I was there for the the premiere and it's I did radio interviews and all these things and it was kind of insane to see sort of the love and the appreciation they have but Daibo invited me to his house for coffee uh, and he's since wrote a book um, so I brought that and he made me coffee in his home which is by far like a top experience of my life. Whoa. Uh, his wife was there and she made little cakes and it was in this beautiful neighborhood. And um, yeah, it was cool. But it was interesting because with Japanese culture, they it's very much about respect. And sometimes you you don't say things necessarily, but you may. I don't know. It's just it's different. It's something I'm sort of learning with Japanese business. And so. He had this, he, when we sat down, he had this binder of communication that we had back and forth. Um, and he didn't know that the film had launched, but I didn't have a way to talk to him. I didn't have his phone number. He didn't have an email. He didn't have a Facebook or an Instagram for the cafe. So I didn't have a way to personally let him know that the film was released. So he was like actually upset with me. And that was the weirdest thing 
to be at his home and my translator was like he'd like to know why you didn't tell him and i was like oh god it's like, oh no <laughs> um so that's why he had this binder of communication he was like trying to get to the bottom of it he did it very respectfully um but anyways it was just an interesting experience we it what he wasn't upset but we we got it all figured out and mm -hmm. i think it made us closer <laughs> So cool. The yeah. whole the whole Japanese part. And it was yeah. Bear Pond, right? Bear Pond Espresso. And I think that I was, was a nut. He was so cool. Yeah, he's awesome. And so he's, cool. He's, and his espresso looked like it was like motor oil. It was yes. like this dark. Yeah, it's like what he puts in his motorcycle, I think. But um, yeah, he, he's a nut. He had a little um, Shiba Inu dog and it bit me while we were filming. <laughs> it was just like a strange experience. He didn't let me taste that espresso. All those espressos on the counter, he wouldn't let me taste because he said they weren't right. So he only serves espresso when, like, the conditions are perfect. Wow. And there's something kind of cool and definitely very Japanese cultural about that. Yeah. Um, and just think of being a bartender, like, sitting behind the bar. You're, you're making sort of, you know, old fashions, and you make 100, and you don't let anyone taste them because the, the mix isn't right or, yeah. you know, just you didn't stir it enough times. Or, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, it's it's crazy, and I th I think the sort of the difference in the the old wave of the Japanese kisseten and the new wave of espresso is very cool. How those cultures they don't they clash in a way that they only can in Japan, mm -hmm. but also the young kids also go to the kisseten and they also go to the espresso shops. Mm -hmm. Now the older older people may not go to the espresso shops, but the kids are kind of like dipping their toes in both worlds, and they're very different. So, I mean, it sounds like this whole thing came together so organically for you. Looking back, you've really made a film that captures this crux of a moment for cocktail culture where all these influential people have reached a critical mass and are really kind of in their prime in a way. How does it feel to be able to look back and see that you created that, that you captured this moment that 50 years from now, people are going to look back and like that was when everything changed for specialty coffee culturally in the United States. Yeah, totally. I mean, on there's two levels. As a filmmaker and artist, it's like I have to pat myself on the back for just completing it. This is like <laughs> one of the few, I mean, as you know, this is like, a lot of ideas stir around in this head of mine, but mm -hmm. very few of them come to fruition. I have about 15 now that I want to do. <laughs> we'll see if they come to fruition. Maybe some of them happen just to sort of get me to the next level, but this one, for some reason or another, made its way out into the universe, mm -hmm. and I'm very thankful that it did. It took a lot of patience and time on a lot of people's parts. Um, but yeah, and looking, you know, Eileen Hossi, Rinaldi now, sorry, I didn't add her, her new last name to the end. Her <laughs> last name changed while we were filming, um, I think. Anyways, um, anyway, she said something in one of the Q&As we were having where she participated in a panel. She was like, this film captures a moment in specialty coffee history. I mean, most of the people in the film work at different places now. They either have started their own cafe or they progressed onto something else. Um, uh, thankfully, a lot of the farmers are still, those coffees are being bought by those companies, and that's something I'm really proud to say. Um, I'm proud of the companies mm -hmm. and the farmers for sort of keeping that going. Um, and a lot of them have discovered new farms. But it is cool to see um, where specialty coffee was, I mean, when the film came out two years ago, where it is today. Um, I still follow everything. I'm still sort of like, I don't have as much of my nose to the grindstone and you know ear to the railroad as I used to when I was trying to find these certain little stories but I still enjoy following it mostly because I know that a lot of these really passionate people in the industry they're trying to support these farmers and they're trying to get a really good cup of coffee at the end of the day mm -hmm. and they're doing that for us and I think that's something as as coffee drinkers and viewers we should be thankful for but um yeah, I encourage you, if you haven't seen the movie, check it out, because I think it'll give you appreciation for coffee like you haven't had before. Um, and I, I'm proud of that. And one more time, how do people check it out? Yeah, you can um, check out the coffee through a filmaboutcoffee.com. You can find it on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, uh, through Vimeo. If you Google a film about coffee, it'll come up. Awesome. Yep. Thanks for uh, being game, for jumping on here. Yeah, totally. I'm glad it's we did fun. this. Success.